Hello, and welcome to another edition of Leafless, Not Lifeless. I'm Sharon Benjamin, your host. Thank you so much for joining me. As always, I have an amazing guest today, Dante Muse, who is going to tell us about his journey in evolving into an art studio owner and how that came about and just what he's doing in the community, some of the his writings and just a number of things that he is going to share to show how he might have appeared to be leafless, but he was actually growing and developing and how he's actually delving into the community and helping others. Welcome, Dante. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. So Dante, you talked about early on about how you actually, a few years ago, you were basically a stick figure artist. So how did you evolve into a studio, a art studio owner? Um, well, I had already <laughs> owned the, the gallery before um, I started producing visual art myself. Um, so that had already happened. I ended up catching the bug because of I was around so much art and around so many artists and it kind of just developed by osmosis. Um, but yeah, it was a, a journey to getting around and deciding I wanted to even open a gallery, but everything really with visual arts happened once I did. Well, that's kind of amazing to go from, from a stick figure artist to uh, where you are now. How how was that? I mean, you talk, you mentioned osmosis, yes, but there must have already been something in there. Um, or was I it? don't know where it was that. I couldn't draw at all as a kid, like at all. Like I really, I tried. I used to go to the library and get the how to draw books and everything, and try to do the stuff step by step. And um, see, I just aged myself. We had libraries when I was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go to the library with your library card, you know, yes. check out oh, yeah. stuff oh, yeah. week, oh, yeah. you know. Um, so I used to do that and I did okay when I was, you know, following or tracing, but anytime I tried to go freehand, it was over. It just was like, yeah, this is not my natural skill and talent, you know, uh writing and you know, oration and you know, words were always my thing, always was in like advanced English, you know, things like that. So um I leaned more towards um literature and writing my first talents were definitely poetry you know writing um anything with the the spoken or written word really and then once I tried to do things um more as a a challenge to myself um I think it was just one night uh, uh um I wanted to create and just wanted a different medium so I just started drawing and um, started from from lines, from sticks, you know, drawing straight lines and then, you know, adding curves. And there was a whole lot of racing going on. And, you know, I just started adding more and more, um, you know, pieces of elements, like really everything comes from basic primary shapes. Um, and then, you know, alterations are made to them. So it's like, if you can make those basic ones as a foundation, you can, pretty much figure out how everything else would, would fit. So um, just kind of took myself, you know, just adding more and more things challenging. And it was, it was really fun, um, which is a huge part of what made me do it. What I started doing um, after I did like some basic putting triangles and squares and circles together to actually make forms, um, I started to create a series. Um, so I was telling stories, which is what I think the best art does anyway. Um, but I was telling stories with my art, with cartoon characters. So I was using some characters from uh, Super Mario's. Um, and they were like just these little ghostly characters that like had masks on so you couldn't see their face. They're like little hockey masks. Um, so I was making those characters and I was telling a storyline with them. So they were mischievous in Super Mario. So I, I made them mischievous in my painting. So I called them like the Goon Gang. And I did like a series of like seven to eight different scenes with them just like getting into trouble, you know, type of stuff. Like I got one, one um like the little baby one trying to catch a butterfly all innocently. 
and then the one behind him has a stick of dynamite in his hand. Like, like you know, like he's about to blow up the butterfly, like just going above and beyond, like actually yes, like stuff yes. that made me laugh while I was creating. Like, oh, this is funny, you know. So um, you you, so, you actually you actually made it fun and and yes. so your you you saw your talent come out. I want to step back a bit. You mentioned that you were already operating a studio. Mm -hmm. Before. So why were you doing that? Is you know and I mentioned that something must have already been there. You were like, "Well, I'm not sure, but apparently because you were operating the studio." How did well, that come about? It, it it wasn't for me. We didn't start it. Um, so I originally started, I had a partner when I started. Um, you know, he's done got married and he moved on, all that type of stuff. So it's just me. But um, when I originally started, it was about providing opportunities for artists. So it was never about me being an artist, you know, doing, you know, showing any of my own crafts or talent. Um, we come from parties. I started doing my, my first party at 11 years old. Um, pay party, charge everybody, all of that, you know. Um, so kind of figured out ways to be community organizers and event planners before we even know what that was. You know, it was literally kids. Um, so again, that was another incident of kind of running into your natural skills, talents, and abilities. You just do what you do. Like it's not, you know, real plan or purpose, um, at least on this end, kind of just living, right? So um, we were coming out of uh, managing a club and um, the incident, you know, it wasn't a like clean ending type of thing. Uh, we ended up packing it like over capacity and, fire marshal came it was fines all over the place all types of stuff going on um and that in that turmoil that was like our split um so we kind of were running out of places particularly for for black people to have events to have fun to have freedom to do things um there's not a lot of people that own spaces that look like us particularly commercial spaces you can come in and do things so um I noticed that we were being mistreated when we went to other, you know, people's venues. We were asked to do things like get extra security. You didn't ask for that the night before when it was, it was full with Spanish people. Like you didn't, you didn't ask that, you know, oh, now the, the alcohol costs almost twice as much on our nights. It wasn't that before on Thursday it was the white people. Like, so what is, you know, um, so just, not being able to to control that and you know to set ourselves up for for success and, and to have fun so, um so we opened the space mm -hmm. for that you know um we do events at the space so we continue you know our nightlife it just transitioned from the club lounge scene so it was like all right now we have to provide alternative, you know, forms of entertainment that's still going to be cool that people still going to want to come out to do and everything. So, you know, of course we do, um, you know, we do a live painting and spoken word event. You know, we do a, a black wine tasting, which is, you know, highlighting all black winemakers and, you know, really giving them awareness because art is a lot of wine around, but we weren't really supporting our own because we weren't aware of them. So figuring yes. out who they were, you know, having events to let other people know about them um, has really helped with distribution as well. You know, in the state, it's hard to get wine in Jersey. Um, so that's some of the things that, that we do. And we even do that to bring more eyes on the art because again, something with us, most of us haven't grown up going to art galleries. You probably only went to museums when you were, you know, school trips and stuff like that. Most of the time that wasn't like a regular thing that most of us have grown up with. Um, so we do the events. Half the time people don't even know they're coming to an art gallery. So once they get there, then it's like, oh, you know, you're surprised, you know, the, the right, stuff is on right, the wall, right. you know, you get that. So um, it's more exposure for the artists. So we are able to get, you know, 100 to 200 people every month through the gallery. Most art galleries don't have that type of foot traffic because, you know, we have an event based model and our events are jumping. Um, so but sure. I was already doing that. Yeah, I was doing that for the other artists. And then once I started doing my own stuff, you know, kind of put it into the fold a little bit. 
So you are you were innovative, and you you talked about um, how your gifts and opportunities kind of come in alignment. Mm -hmm. Your abilities and uh, offering opportunities. So you talked about your school counselor and not really not really beneficial to you in a sense. Mm -hmm. So um, how was it with your, how did you get support? Who was your support system? What was your support system to move you forward? Um, when at which point when I was in school or once yes. I was already oh, well, as you as you were in school and going through your educational life. Um, well, I mean, my biggest support is always, of course, is you know my parents. Um, they still, I mean, still to this day, I have you know we do a lot of things, have stuff going on. I have a, a son and a daughter, so they're there to watch them. So you know, like. Like my parents are definitely still, you know, my number one supporters. Um, couldn't do anything without them, definitely. So, but beyond that, I mean, really just in the in, in internal drive, um, kind of have feel, fear of failure. So I got to succeed at something, you know, um, so keep pushing with, with, with that. Um, I mean, I've always kind of known I was supposed to do something to that was going to end up eventually putting me in the light. Um, I kind of tried to stay in the middle, you know, my whole life, you know, be away from the bottom because you don't want to be at the bottom, but I ain't want to be at the top or on the light because that's everybody see you. And once the light is on you, it's on you, you know. Um, so I ran from that my whole life. Uh, it's now I realize. I, I can't run from it anyway. I might as well embrace it. So, you know, I've been kind of transitioning into that. Uh, um, but, yeah, I just wanted to sit back and, and, and serve. But without them, I, I couldn't do it. So, okay, so I, have, you know, I right. have a question for you. Uh, you mentioned entrepreneur. What is that? Artpreneur. So, uh, um, so uh, uh, entrepreneur is... An entrepreneur, um, because artists are entrepreneurs. It's yes. just being specific about you know what you're an entrepreneur of. You know, it's just art. So, um, a lot of artists probably don't even consider themselves entrepreneurs, um, which is a huge problem because then you don't conduct yourself as if you don't conduct yourself as if you're actually doing business. You know, um, so that runs into a whole nother set of issues, but that's, that's what it is. It's an art entrepreneur. So how did you um, get to the point where, you know, we, and, and, and to your point, kind of piggybacking on what you just said with some artists, you know, often we will see artists who are, you know, they're walking with their instruments or they're working as waiters or waitresses. And we hear the phrase, the starving artist, how did you go from that point or were you ever there or how did you not become the starving artist? Um, so, well, my situation is twofold because I have, I have the gallery, which is a business. Um, and then I have my own, you know, personal artistic practice. So it's kind of, well, it's two things to manage, but it is also two streams of income. Um, so that helps. <laughs> that definitely helps. Um, but in terms of my personal artistry, um, I was, I mean, I guess I can say fortunate enough. It was very strategic, but we can still call it fortune. Um, but I was fortunate enough to kind of get into a situation where um, most of my work, I, I, sell I guess you can call it that um because it didn't exist before I sold it so I was a little confused about that but most of the stuff is like commission-based type um so and I don't do portraits or anything really but I get asked by you know the city or the county to do different projects um you know host workshops seminars different things like that so 
Um, I make income through that. As far as my personal artistry, often I don't have like art like sitting around that I've created that you can look through and choose from, you know, to sell stuff. It's like, all right, you asked me for this, I create this, now you got that. And then I might go back and just do administrative stuff because I have more than enough of that to do, you know, for a whole month before somebody, you know, goes me to the paint and draw again for whatever reason. Um, so that's kind of how my situation is. And, and, and me being a writer as well, of course, you know, I write grants, um, you know, for projects as well, which is also another stream of income. So, um, and then I coach artists on art business as well too, which, you know, supplements. So what is this? Pay the artist first. So Pay the Artist is my group coaching program. Um, so it is an online community of artists. Um, we are international. We do have, I think, five or six artists that are not in the States that are currently part of the community. Um, so we meet online via Zoom twice a month minimum. Um, you know, oftentimes we meet more than that, but we meet about an hour, hour and a half some days. Um, and, you know, we talk all about the art business. So I cover marketing, branding, sales, positioning, you know, to help get yourself more opportunities. You know, if you want to go institutional route, if you want to go galleries, you can do that. If you want to be, you know, totally independent, self-sufficient, there's ways to do whatever it is you want to do once we decide what it is you want to do. So, um, so that is the club. It is group coaching. So nothing is private out, you know, outside the group. So if you do say something, um, it does typically help the other artists that's in the group. Cause oftentimes there's something you forgot to ask, or you didn't even know to ask. You didn't even know you need that information, but somebody else in the group will bring something up and you're like, Oh yeah, that's good. You know, I need that as well. Um, so I really love the, the paid artist club. So this reminds me of the writing support groups uh, with with different uh, literary artists. You also want to go here. Growth strategy call. What is this about? So if you do want to have a one on one, if you, you know, some people don't function well in groups or just kind of want to, you know, that, that personal attention or personal touch on them. Um, we can definitely do that. The growth strategy call will, will get you that. So, um, you know, in the strategy call, we assess where it is you are now, um, where it is you want to go. And we devise a strategy on how to execute, uh, this plan so you can get to where it is that you want to go. Um, so that's specific to your situation based off of what your resources are. It's not a, a cookie cutter. You know, um, anybody just has to do these exact steps. Everybody's situation is slightly different. You're in a different market. You know, you have different resources. So um, different skills and abilities, of course. So if you want to lean on the ones that you do have, um, your network that you already have and building from there. So we take care of all of that in the one-on-one -on -one strategy call. So that call is an hour long um, and you're going to have more than enough homework to do <laughs> based out of that. So from there, it's just going to be a matter of, you know, the artist executing. That's the difference between so six with, Okay. So with this, the growth strategy call, you mentioned it's an hour long. What about follow-up? Is there or... Is there a need for follow-up or can the clients do a follow-up? Um, they can definitely do a follow-up. I mean, you can book the the strategy calls as, as often as you like. Um, and, you know, it's based upon our respective schedules. So, you know, we can make it fit somewhere. Um, typically, you would, I mean, I guess it would depend on how active you are. Um, because I have had artists that had like um, events coming up in let's say like four months out for the event where we're meeting every month, you know, kind of, all right, did you do this? Checking up, you know, leading into it. So they got have a great event. Um, one artist that I'm thinking of, the last one that did it, uh, Leia to Leia, she um, ended up selling over $7,000 worth of, of work. Um, you know, it was her largest and, and greatest show that she had to date. 
move, you know, record number of pieces. Um, the outcome was was ridiculous. And then after her event, you know, she's like, I'll hit you up, you know, next time. So you got something coming up. So I guess when she gets ready to go ahead and plan her her next show and everything, you know, she'll she'll tap back in and um kind of use me as a uh project manager and you know consultant as she goes into that. Um, but it's it's really about how comfortable you feel, um, what level of support that you feel you need. And I mean, I'm be here for you if you know you're ready, willing, and able to invest in yourself to grow. Um, we'll definitely more than double your money. So so what about and it sounds as if at this so far we've talked about how you help adults. Do you have any mentoring programs, any kind of encouragement programs for youth? Because in your information that I read, you talk about how athletics are pushed a lot more than art. So mm -hmm. what do you have that would help young people to be able to differentiate the options between not that they wouldn't do sports or athletics, but to encourage them to tap into their abilities. Because I know when I was teaching elementary school, there were some amazing students, artists in third and fourth grade. One of them has become a doctor. Uh, but uh, so how, how do you help the young people to see and and not be discouraged just because they're only drawing stick figures at this point? Uh, I mean, as with anything, even with the sports, you're only going to get better by the repetition. Like they're good at the sports because they do it over and over and over. You know, they're putting in their 10,000 hours. So it would have to be the same thing as far as with, with anyone's artistry, regardless what the medium is. You got to put in the work. You got to practice. You know, you have to fail. You have to fail um, in order to get better. So art programming in schools um, and, and encouraging that is, is huge. That's where the children are going to spend majority of their day anyway. Um, so getting to them is not, if you're not in the school, and then if you're in school, you're usually in one. So it's not as easy as I would like it to be to do that. Um, as far as the gallery, I mean, we offer um, art classes um, periodically. We used to do it like every month before, you know, the world shut down. We kind of haven't got back into that that swing, but we, we do have one actually coming up on May the 20th. So um, we are getting back into them. And as the summer comes up and people are outside and kids are not in school, we can do a little more and they'll be able to come through because um, their parents want to get rid of them. So we definitely want to take advantage of that. Um, but throughout the school year, it's not as easy um, to kind of encourage that. Um, but overall the people that are in position to do that i think really just letting them practice give them the opportunity to because a lot of times you discover your talents you're like oh i'm actually okay at this you know and then you kind of start going from there so trying out a bunch of different things um but i mean as much of your brain as you use as as an artist particularly a musician um i would still encourage kids to try to do sports um, because you want that energy burning and, you know, keeping them active in motion thing, but not everybody has the, you know, the skill set for that. So try to do that. If you can, if you discover you're not the best at that, then how about you come in, you know, let's do some drawing. Let's, you know, go on and, into that and, and see what you might have um, in terms of talent or even, you know, just vision in that area because some people have uh creative minds but can't necessarily you know manifest this and produce this so they can might be able to supervise they can be a creative director and say okay this is what we want to do this is how i should look and then actually have the person that can put that together you know with their hands so you can still have some you know creative abilities and kind of find your niche but you got to try different things you got to practice true. different things that's you know? true that's true i was thinking about um our oldest son and his wife have a six-year-old son who's been drawing since he was two or three years old. And they've actually, uh, they've actually framed and displayed some of his work. So I said, That's encouraging. 
<laughs> yes. And he's just, you know, he does it all the time. And uh, our youngest son and his wife have two daughters and the oldest one who will be six as well is drawing as well. So, and, and I think sometimes it's, you know, you talk about exposure and just what you give to students in terms of just letting them see different things, taking them different places. And um, so both of the children, uh, or all of them, the three grandchildren participate in some sports, but also in art as well. Um, so you're involved in other things here. You have written some books and you've received some awards. You're uh, involved in NAACP and I'll let you talk some about your books here. Um, this one, are you an introverted artist? The introverted artist guy <laughs> at the art What, is, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> That is the majority of artists. The majority of artists are going to fall under that category. Okay. Um, and it and it makes sense. Um, you're you have to go within um, to be able to pull these things out. Like particularly the things that don't currently exist. Like where did they come from? So they can only come from inside of you. They only come from your mind. Like everything was in imagination before it became in reality. Like the building you in right now, the architect had to envision it and then draw up a plan before it got built. Like it was in his mind or her mind first. So that's where everything comes from. Um, so most artists are in their own minds, in their own world, most artists are introverted. So they qualify for this. But being in that, you kind of just want to, uh, uh, you just want to art. That's how we say it, right? You don't necessarily want to deal with sales. You don't want to be salesy. You want to ask for sales all the time. Um, you don't necessarily want to negotiate or, you know, deal with contracts and all of that. Uh, but if you want to sustain yourself, some money has to be coming in. So that's why I wrote this book, Introverted Artist Guide to Art Sales showing you how to recognize and use your superpower of introversion to actually get more sales and how you being an introvert is an advantage. Um, so that's what that book's about. That book actually interrupted my um, series, which are the, the other books, Tripping Over Canvases. So Tripping Over Canvases is a, three-part series. Um, I've completed two of the books already and then was inclined to create the Introverted Artist Guide to Art Sales in the midst of it before I finished the last book, which I'm currently working on now, uh, which will be out in the fall. So um, the one we're looking at right now is Tripping Over Canvases, How to Become a Successful Entrepreneur. Um, that is my best-selling book. Um, we did I think we just hit over like a thousand copies for that book, you know, independently, which is, you know, pretty good, I believe. Um, and dropped that one in 2021. Um, so that book is, is a start to finish um, of how you should conduct yourself as an artist, setting up your art business, um, even building business credit as an artist, which you can, um, even if you're just using your own name, but you're actually registered as a business, um, how to choose your market, how to grow community um, networks and benefit from your neighbors to grow your business. Um, it's it's a lot in that one. Um, I, that's probably why it's the favorite, you know. Um, the first book, was tripping over canvases, how to open your own art gallery with no prior experience. Oh, that so, should be interesting. Yes. And, and it, yeah. That with one was real because I had just did it. <laughs> I just opened my own art gallery yes. with no prior experience, you know? Uh, and I really wanted to document and kind of encapsulate that time and uh, um, just put all the things that I've learned 
that I kind of wish someone would have told me going into, you know, that I had to learn the hard way, a lot of trial and error, you know, a lot of nuances. You only going to realize, you know, haven't had that experience. Um, so I wanted to make the path for those that become behind me easier. Um, so I've laid out some things in there. Um, if I can go back and do some things, definitely some of those things were in there as well. Um, even in how to decide what type of gallery you want. Um, is also information on running a strictly online gallery if you don't want the responsibility or the risk of having, you know, the overhead of a brick and mortar spot, um, you know, rent to pay, money, insurance, all of that, you know, and art, you got to keep a million dollars insurance. So um, that that book was definitely, it sold very well as well too, but the the how to become a successful entrepreneur is is definitely the the leading book. I think it's probably the most general um, anyway, which is probably why it, it does the best. Not everyone wants the responsibility of having their own space. That's true. Um, be it physical or online, you know. Um, and of course, not everyone is an introvert or feel they, they need help in that area. So, um, but if you're an artist and you're selling your art, you are an entrepreneur. So that one pretty much goes for everybody. So, uh, so, Art, gallery owner, author, mentor, business owner. You're also involved in other things in the community, in NAACP. And what else are you doing in the community? Helping other people to see. Now, uh, as you're talking, as you've talked and have shared, we see how you're actually helping other people who might not realize they have so much inside of them. And, and even yourself becoming, uh, going from being a stick figure <laughs> artist. So what else are you doing in the community? Um, so majority of things we are doing are um, artist focused. So, I mean, the, I am, you know, executive member of my local NAACP chapter. That's not necessarily artist focused. That's just, you know, more just us focused in general, but, um, so I'm part of a few initiatives. Um, one is a partnership I have with Karis Park Community Connections um, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield um, to get artists and creatives free health care in the state of New Jersey. Um, so they don't have to be about to die before, you know, they go to get somebody to look at them. You know, we can have preventative measures for things and hit things in the head before they become serious issues. Um, my first mentor in art passed away from cancer because of, you know, lapses in insurance coverage. Um, and by the time, you know, they really find out what was going on, it was too late. And um, actually right before him, the year before him, there was another major figure in the art scene um, in Newark that passed away from cancer as well. So like those he wasn't my direct mentor, but, you know, he was a heavy influence. Um, so those kind of back to back, like triggered that uh, from starting and happening. So we do that at least a couple of times a year. Um, and we were able to get artists and their families covered. So there was artists that couldn't even tell you the last time they've been to the dentist. You know, they only go when it's a tooth because other than that, it's going to cost them a lot of money. Most artists work. Um, multiple jobs, a lot of part-time situations, you know, you're gigging, you're contracting, so you're not even offered, you know, health insurance, you know, even though you figured out how to bring income in. Um, so making sure that that is taken care of is is one of the biggest things that, you know, we've been doing in the community. Um, but we do, at the gallery, we do, um, was, you know, what, what we call in, internally like a homeless paint and sip, but uh, for uh, critical pol political uh, correctness, we can't kind of call it that, but it's like a art therapy for the transitional population. You yeah. know, yeah. Um, so we do you know free paint and sip, you know, for the for the homeless, basically, essentially. Um, you know, giving how them often, that. I'm sorry for interrupting. How often yeah, is that done? How often? Um, is so done? we we do that twice a year. Um, we are actually founders of. Uh, the New Brunswick Heart Festival, which is the History, Education, and Art Festival. So this would be the fourth year um, for that. So 
um, festival growing. I mean, we started like right in the pandemic. So it originally started virtually. Um, so it would have been a lot bigger than what it is now already, but we, we've already hit, you know, over a thousand people coming through the festival. So it's just a one day event and we do a block party right in front of my gallery. So the whole block is out, um, for that festival. So it's like a concert right in front of the gallery. And there's like a big triangle that, you know, my street is just one of the, the streets on the triangle, but all of that is blocked off downtown New Brunswick. Um, in front of the Performing Arts Center, State Theater, all of that. And there's a bunch of artists and vendors everywhere. Um, so that actually happens every August. It's going to be August 12th this year. Um, so, you know, we founded that. But, yeah, just really staying active and, you know, providing, seeing where the, the gaps are, where the holes are, and, and filling them in. And we're actually, um, you know, writing a grant right now for a, a fatherhood initiative um, that we hope to be starting in July. So, again, before things closed down, we were, we were doing more, we were a lot more active. Um, we used to do a men's meeting every month, um, you know, just gathering and support, you know, for men networking. Um, we had my, one of my close friends was a meditation uh, laureate for the city of Newark. He's also a certified uh, counselor. So he would come in, you know, do some sessions, things like that, like, We've had everything, you know, laughs, tears, jokes, and, and men raging from, you know, 14 to, uh, I think, 67 was the oldest. No, Alvin came one time, so 73. Um, so, you know, you know, really sharing different wisdoms and different generations, like, that was definitely cool. So figuring out a way to kind of bring that back. And I was just a, a free community event, you know, didn't charge nobody for it, didn't get paid for it. Um, you know, like I said, now I'm writing this grant to to pull that in to get to right, get paid for right, it. Exactly. You know, um, but we've always we've been doing the work. You know, since we opened the door, we've been doing the work. So now it's just uh, you know, being compensated so we can do more work essentially. Right. Right. The you mentioned the homeless uh, paint and sip. How do you advertise for that? How do you get the guests? Um, well, we walk outside. That's, <laughs> okay. that's, that's one. Um, I didn't realize it. And it's crazy because I'm, I'm, I'm from Elizabeth, which is, um, you know, it's rough. It's the fourth largest city in the state. And it's, it's tied right next to Newark, which is Newark. You, you know, everybody knows anything about Jersey, you know, Newark. It is what it is. Uh, um, and you figure out, you know, living majority of my life in, in those two cities, um, you wouldn't think other cities had some of the same issues, particularly if you haven't like heard about them. Um, but I went to New Brunswick and there's it's homeless people everywhere. I'm like, this is crazy. Um, so you can walk down the main street and find them, you know, a couple of the side streets is it's not difficult. Um, but we actually partnered with um Elijah's Promise, which is a soup kitchen. Um, and we part with um Arm, which is uh Archangels Raphael's mission. Um, and they've grown actually at this point, they have mobile shower units. Um, so they can pull up with the mobile shower units and everything. But they were before they even got those, they were already doing work. They will always come through with toiletries and you know, different things that that we needed for them. So we would you know, have partnered with them. So they come through with some stuff. Um, at We also were working with an organization called Treehouse Cares, um, which has contracts with like Trader Joe's and Wegmans and all of these, these um, organic food places that, you know, had surplus of food. So they've given us thousands of pounds of food. So we're giving out food, you know, at these events. We're actually just doing that part every week at one point, just um, having to be a, kind of like a pantry um, on every Sunday. We, we were doing that again before the world shut down, um, giving out tons of food, like vans of food. Um, so, you know, partnering with community organizations that, again, are already doing the work. Like, you, you, it's show and prove. So it's like, I see this is what you're doing. Let me help you do what you're already doing. Like, it's in alignment, you know. 
um, particularly if it's going to check off a box on your business, if you know it's going to make you look good or it's going to make sure you get paid again next year because you hit this this criteria, you know, that was in your grant or whatever. So um, it's identifying those resources and then just approaching them. So this has been uh, wonderful. Where is your studio located? Let people know how to get in touch with you. Yes. So my gallery is above art studios. Uh, art is singular studios is plural. Above art studios, we are located downtown New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, you can visit us on our website anywhere or any social media uh, above art studios and above art studios dot com. Um, sign up for the mailing list and you'll be able to, you know, get the notifications of any events that we have coming up. Uh, you can also find my direct page um, on Instagram at I am D Muse. First initial, last name, D Muse. And um, I am D Muse dot com is my personal website as well. So you mentioned a couple of things that are coming up. What are some of the other things just rehearse for us again? What you have in the works coming up in the near future? Um, I got a, a, a bunch of different things now because, again, I, I, I do a lot. So the gallery has some things. I have some things. But well, this, we, we give, definitely us, give us a taste of some of them. What are what are some of the things that are <laughs> happening? So we. We, we're definitely, um, you know, building up to a couple of festivals. So the first one is the the Heart Festival. Um, we are actually getting ready to put the call out for artists for the art market. Um, so if anybody wants to come and sell their art and also vendors. Ooh, oh, sorry, spam. Um, also vendors um, who want to, you know, peddle their wares as well. Um, that is August 12th. We have the Sustainable Health and Wellness Village Festival. Um, and that one, we actually do, uh, we did 276 uh, free pairs of prescription eyeglasses last year. Um, yeah, we had like something like 400 eye screens. Um, and then, yeah, 276 people who needed glasses. Um, and then we actually just got feedback from the Board of Education because they were recently talking about us and how much better the students are doing, how grades are going up and everything. I'm like, yeah, because they can see. It, make, it makes sense. They couldn't see nothing before, you know. So um, so I, I definitely like we getting feedback about that, you know, from last year when we did it. So that's coming up. That is going to be is a two-day festival. That's September 15th and 16th. Um, I believe that weekend. Um, outside of that, putting together this initiative um, to do another run for the healthcare, uh, we're partnering with uh, Mana Contemporary, who's a huge art organization, you know, located uh, in Jersey City, Chicago, and Miami. Um, so Mana is big, so we're looking to serve more artists. Um, that's pretty much the, the major things, of course, at Above Art Studios. We have events going on pretty much every weekend. So make sure you come through for, you know, a, a wine tasting or, you know, a game night or, you know, a, a poetry event. Or, you know, we, we we have pretty creative programming. So make sure you check us out everywhere again at Above Art Studios. And um, the next book will be dropping in the fall, the final chapter of Tripping Over Canvases. And that'll be tripping over campuses, how to curate a successful art life. And we're going to be focusing more on being a curator, um, how to put things together, shows, opportunities, proposals, so you can create more opportunities um, for yourself. So that'll be dropping in the fall. Thank you so much. I appreciate all this information. And I'm sure you're going to be getting people contacting you. This is awesome. Thank you so much, Dante Muse for being with me on Leafless Not Lifeless. I'm Sharon Benjamin, your host for Leafless Not Lifeless. You may contact me at leaflessnotlifeless at gmail.com. And let me know if you have a story. Were you appearing to be leafless, but you were actually growing and developing? I'd like to share your story. Again, leaflessnotlifeless at gmail.com. Again, thank you for watching. Thank you for viewing. And Dante, thank you again for being with me.
Thank you for having me.